Lesson 65. Hello again. In this lesson, our focus will be on the view camera, or more specifically, the 8x10 view camera. As you take a look at this rather large camera, which is a Burke and James Grover manufactured in the 50s, you may be at a complete loss as to why anybody would ever want to take photos with something so uh, unportable and inconvenient. The truth is, this type of camera was not only what Ansel Adams lugged around while taking his breathtaking landscapes of Yosemite, but it's been used for commercial photographic applications for a very long time. More notably, still live product photography and portraiture. So you're probably wondering why this camera is so special. Well, for one thing, it produces an image that is 8 by 10 inches either in the form of a film negative or a print negative. The result is an image of incredibly high resolution the likes of which can only be matched by a super high resolution digital image. Photographers have used view cameras like this for years because they've demanded the best results a camera could produce with regard to crispness and detail, not to mention enlargeability. More recently, many alternative process photographers, including myself, are returning to large format view cameras to pursue their art. But the wonderfully detailed images it produces is only part of the story. This camera is capable of correcting for distortion in subjects, plus increased depth of field by a rather sophisticated system of tilts, shifts, swings, rise and fall. The bellows assembly you see here enables the lens board and the rear viewing standard to move independently of each other, aiding in an increased focusing plane range and the ability to correct image perspective and distortion. There's nothing simple about operating this camera, yet ironically, it's one of the simplest cameras ever made next to a pinhole. After removing the rear frame, you see nothing but black space and the lens at the front end of the camera, where the exposure settings are made. Focus is achieved by moving the lens board forward and backward until the subject is focused on the ground glass. The scene you see shows you exactly how a camera obscura works, with the visible image appearing upside down and backwards. There's nothing like a prism or mirror to correct this, so what you see is literally what you get recorded on film. It's a little tough getting used to viewing things upside down, but you do eventually get used to it. Besides that, you can always climb on top of a chair and look from above if necessary. So how does this thing work? The front and rear standards are attached to a monorail, which allows for forward and backward movement. The lens is an interchangeable leaf shutter type, which is incredibly sharp and bright. The lens I'm using here is a 210mm Fujinon. To view a scene, you must first cock the shutter and then slide a lever that opens the lens aperture. Here you can see the effect of increasing and decreasing the aperture size. To compose a scene, you always want to set the f-stop to the smallest number, which is the largest aperture opening. In this case, f5.6. Shutter speed is set by rotating this knob. There's no built-in light meter in a view camera, so exposure must be determined by means of a handheld meter. See Lesson 46 to learn more about light meters. To demonstrate the camera movements I mentioned before, this is called tilt, which can be used to correct distortion in subjects. This is rise and fall, which changes the vertical composition and allows you to include parts of an image without tilting the entire camera up or down. This is a swing, which is often used to increase the depth of field for close-up subjects. Using these movements comes with experience and will be discussed in a future lesson. Now that the aperture is open, I go back and take a look at what I have. If I want to shoot in vertical format instead of horizontal, I simply remove the ground glass frame and replace it in the vertical position. I focus the image by moving either the front standard or rear standard until the image is crisp. I often use a loop placed on the ground glass so I can make precise adjustments with the focusing knob. Sometimes it's necessary to place a dark cloth, commonly known as a focusing cloth, to block out ambient light and reflections so you can see the image better. If I want to make the subject bigger, I have to move the camera closer. No zooming in or out with these babies. Once you change the focal distance, you of course have to refocus accordingly. You can change the composition slightly without adjusting the camera position by raising or lowering the front or rear standards like so, or from side to side. Always tighten down the screws once you get everything where you want it. After I've determined exposure with a handheld meter, I close down the aperture and then set the f-stop and shutter speed. Prior to shooting, you'll have to load a film holder with either film or photo paper. 
This is a pretty involved process with a learning curve, so I'll show you how to do that, plus how to process your film in the next lesson. After my film's loaded in the film holder, I go back to the rear of the camera to insert it into the camera. Note that the scene is no longer visible on the ground glass since the lens is now closed. The film will be in the exact same position as the ground glass once it's loaded. To load, you insert the film holder into the slot and the pressure back like so. Push it all the way in until it stops. Now I'll pull out the dark slide closest to the front, which will uncover the film for exposure. Next, I'll release the shutter by use of the shutter release cable. Now replace the dark slide. The slides are usually marked so that you can remember whether the film's been exposed or not. I use the silver or white side to show that it's unexposed, and use the black side after it's been exposed. Now I remove the film holder like so. To take another shot, I flip the film holder around and repeat the process, making sure to cock the shutter again. It's always a good idea to shoot at least two shots of a scene and bracketing exposures to be sure that you've gotten a decent exposure. Exposure varies greatly with these cameras depending on how far the bellows is extended, with the light having to travel further the more it is extended. One thing I've done to make test exposures with this camera is build a back that has a Polaroid film back attached to it. Back in the old days, shooting Polaroids were the only way to test exposures and get an idea of what your images will look like on film without having to wait to process it. I built this back by cutting a hole in the center of a piece of plywood that I'd cut the same size as the back and then gluing the Polaroid film back to it. I eliminated light leaks by using caulk and Velcro. Although the size of the instant print is only a small portion of the total image, I can still test the shot and get the results in 60 seconds, which is really handy. You can still use Fujifilm for this purpose. Well, that's about it for this lesson. If you're interested in giving view cameras a try, you can find plenty of them on the internet, and you'd be surprised how affordable they can be. If you're on a tight budget, get a hold of a smaller size 4x5 view camera and give it a spin. I think you'll be delighted with the quality of images you can capture. Until next time, goodbye.